Welcome, genre fans. In this episode, we will be exploring one of the major collaborators who contributed to the genre, or Fione in Italian, called Giallo, Lucio Fulci. While this video covers the work of a single director, we do recognize the challenges and limitations of auteur theory. Directors frequently receive all credit for their films when in fact it is a collaborative medium involving dozens to thousands of cast and crew members to make each film. We will try to acknowledge other collaborators as best we can. Born in Rome on June 17, 1927, to a Sicilian mother and an absentee father, Lucio Fulci was raised by his mother and a housekeeper. His mother wanted him to become a lawyer, but he opted for medical school where he learned the inner workings of human anatomy, knowledge which he would later use for gore effects. Deciding that the film world was more lucrative than medicine, Fulci dropped out and quickly became an art critic, writing for Art Gazette and Rome's The Messenger. He joined a critics club called The Social Art Group, headed by painter Renzo Vespignani, whose morbid paintings of eviscerated corpses would influence Fulci's love of blood, brains, eyeballs, slime, maggots, and entrails. The Beyond has a painting at the center of its narrative depicting a barren hellscape littered with corpses, a reflection of the influence from this period of Fulci's life. In the immediate aftermath of World War II, Fulci studied at the prestigious Roman film school Centro Sperimentale di Cinematography. After learning from filmmakers like Visconti and Antonioni, Fulci was hired as an assistant second unit director on Marcel Lerbier's The Last Days of Pompeii. He then made a series of documentary shorts in 1948 before spending the 50s working as an assistant director and screenwriter, primarily in comedy. During this time, he also had a brief stint as editor of film journal La Settimana Income. The director Steno, full name Stefano Vanzina, seems to have been his mentor bringing Fulci under his wing to work on several vehicles for megastar comedian Toto, including a job as assistant director on Rossellini's comedy, Where's Freedom? Fulci's directorial debut was another Toto comedy called The Thieves in 1959. He then made a quick succession of teenage jukebox films, Irigazi de Jukebox, Howlers of the Dark, and Uno Strano Tipo. Throughout the 60s, Fulci specialized in farces starring comedy duo Franco Franchi and Ciccio Ingrassia, known as Franco and Ciccio. Sensing that his career was stagnating in Commedia all'Italiana, Fulci fought to make Giallo one on top of the other in 1969. This accelerated his career by breaking him out to work in a variety of genres. Spaghetti Westerns with The Four of the Apocalypse and Silver Saddle, Children's Adventure with White Fang and Challenge to White Fang, Costume Drama with Beatrice Tenchi, Sword and Sorcery with Conquest, Dystopian Sci-Fi with The War of 2072, Crime Thrillers like The Smuggler, and Sex Comedies like The Edwiga Fennec Vehicle, My Sister-in-Law. Fulci's Jolly were distillations of his cynical worldview and preoccupation with bodily mutilation, forecasting his most famous and shocking horror films. They were stepping stones to his infamous Benoit moment of the splinter eye gouge in Zombie. One on top of the other was Fulci's first giallo. Inspired more by Romolo Guerrieri's The Sweet Body of Deborah than Mario Bava's Blood and Black Lace, Fulci self-consciously set out to make an erotic thriller about an insurance scam. The plot centers around Dr. George de Maurier, who runs a clinic and courts controversy in the press, despite his brother Henry's objections. He carries on an affair with photographer Jane behind asthmatic wife Susan's back. Susan dies while the two lovers are on a Reno excursion, which results in a million dollar insurance payout. But things become complicated for George when an anonymous phone call leads him to Susan's doppelganger, exotic dancer Monica. Hitchcock's seminal thriller Vertigo is the primary influence on one on top of the other. Like Vertigo, it features lush cinema cinematography of San Francisco, and a moody romantic Riz Ordolani score reminiscent of Bernard Herrmann. More importantly, Fulci uses the women split in two character as a structural device. There are many similarities to Kim Novak's dual roles of Madeline Elster and Judy Barton. Susan de Maurier is brunette, while Monica Weston is fair. Susan is wealthy and sickly, whereas Monica holds a physically demanding stripper job. The final twist reveals that they are the same woman orchestrating a getting away with murder plot with an innocent man as the fall guy. Escaping at Kennedy Airport, Susan goes to the restroom and takes off her blonde wig and washes her green contacts down the drain. 
Frequent Giallo leading man Jean Sorel plays wrongman George de Murier. Fiona regular Alberto de Mendoza plays George's two-timing brother Henry. Notably, B-movie legend John Ireland plays Inspector Walls, a nod to old Hollywood. Fresh off a collaboration with Mario Bava in Danger Diabolique, Rose the Mal plays Susan slash Monica. Since this film lacks Bava's heightened aesthetic and killer design, it seemingly barely qualifies as a giallo. Though Fulci shot the interior scenes in Rome, the film is set in America, which detracts from the Eurosleaze aesthetic. There is no sartorial killer. Susan's alleged murder is off-screen and turns out to be staged. There are no Baroque violent scenes that lend to an atmosphere of violence for violence's sake. In the end, the only murders we see are in a quick public shooting. Monica's jealous admirer, Benjamin Wormser, kills Henry and her in a Parisian cafe. In favor of one on top of the other's giallo classification is its deployment of standard mystery tropes. George and his lover, photographer Jane, emerge as amateur sleuths once the police suspect George of Susan's murder. We have red herrings in the form of an acrobatic dancer and nurse named Elizabeth O'Neill and a mysterious woman named Betty, who doesn't actually exist. Henry and Susan are the conspiring killers who double-cross George and meet a just moral punishment in the end. Additionally, the police presence is minor enough for the film not to be considered polizia tashi. They search Monica's apartment and uncover a key piece of evidence, an envelope containing George's fingerprints which they use to speedily secure his conviction. They analyze handwriting patterns based on pen impressions. In another scene, the specter exhumes Susan's corpse, and we see her decomposing face as her sister gives a positive idea identification. We later find out that this is Elizabeth O'Neill's body. This is followed by a cool split-screen sequence of lab tests. Well, she stages the denouement on location at San Quentin, in addition to doing a lot of location shooting in Reno and New York. This pre-Argento giallo displays Fulci's willingness to experiment and follow his instincts from project to project. See here the glass floor effect he uses to shoot lovers from below. Notorious for its sexuality, one on top of the other crucially bridges vertigo to later erotic thrillers like Basic Instinct and Body of Evidence. Fulci's second giallo, A Lizard in a Woman's Skin, is centered around repressed housewife Carol Hammond. Her nightmares of killing swinging hippie neighbor Julia Durer come true, placing her as the main suspect of a police investigation headed by Inspector Corbin. Carol goes to an analyst who helps her interpret the hallucinatory nightmares. Her duplicitous husband Frank is the obvious suspect. Numerous false suspects, red herrings, and leads populate the film's landscape. A number of hippies, two of which witnessed the murder, Carol's stepdaughter Joan, and even her own father Edmund. Inspector Corvin and Sergeant Brandon lend the film a slight procedural element. We see them processing the Julia Durer crime scene, interrogating suspects, and examining forensic. Inspector Corvin has more personality than most Jalo detectives. He's tough, savvy, and has a quirk where he constantly whistles. Ultimately, he solves the case by following Sherlock Holmes's dictum that when you eliminate all which is impossible, then whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. Fulci foreshadows Carol's guilt in many ways. On her father Edmund's desk are two pictures of her, one where she wears a funeral shroud, another where she is smiling and casually dressed. Freudian symbolism gilds the central act of murder, zombie-like figures, her disemboweled stepdaughter Joan, a malignant bird, and an endless corridor. Despite having incredibly vivid imagery, a lizard in a woman's skin does not follow the method of surreal camera work in saturated color established by Bava and continued by Argento. Fulci proffers the solution to the mystery at the beginning, only to misdirect with me generation psychobabble. Carol doesn't want her affair with Julia to come to light, and kills to stop Julia's blackmail scheme rather than going into a psychotic or fugue state like an Argento killer. We don't see Carol donning gloves, trench coat, and fedora, nor are we steeped in an atmosphere of Baroque violence as in a Bava film. She commits one murder alone while perfectly legally sane. Despite its stylistic excesses, A Lizard in a Woman's Skin is a straight mystery. Frank, Edmund, and to an extent Joan are functionally citizen detectives. 
The hippies are unreliable witnesses, too strung out on LSD to understand what they have seen. Carol, a lizard in a woman's skin, murdering Julia Juror. We see the murder through their eyes at the beginning, and it isn't until the finale that we see it unadorned as Inspector Corbin gives his summation. Fulci inches towards the surreal, gothic, supernatural horror for which he would later become notorious. Special effects maestro Carlo Rambaldi made vivisected dogs for the asylum scene to create an atmosphere of paranoid, nightmarish terror. On a side note, a politician with a personal vendetta used his influence to attempt to prosecute Fulci for animal cruelty, for which Rambaldi produced the dog puppets at trial. We see a zombie-like Joan in a nightmare, gasping and holding her intestines. Rambaldi also made the bats that attack Carol in a scene in an abandoned cathedral attic. Ultimately, a lizard in a woman's skin is a stylistically distinct giallo, uncategorizable like much of Fulci's work. Don't Torture a Duckling is frequently termed Fulci's rural giallo. Like most of his filmography, it is a combination of genre elements. A series of child murders rocks an insular southern rural village. Which outsider is the perpetrator? Bara the peeping Tom, Makara the village witch, or Patrizia the rich girl on the edge of town? The first set of victims are young boys Bruno, Tonino, and Michele. In early scenes, we see the children smoking cigarettes and peeping on midday sex in a shack that locals call the haunted house. After the villagers murder Makara, another boy Mario turns up dead. The killer primarily strangles his victims, although Mario is bludgeoned with a rock and suffocated by drowning. The police explicitly state that none of them have been molested. The conclusion, the killer is not a sex maniac, but suffering from some type of psychosis. Police arrest the first suspect Bara after he tries to extort Bruno's parents. A washerwoman discovers Tonino's body in a well when Bara is in custody, exonerated him. Typical for Fulci, there is no well-designed giallo killer, although we do see gloved hands in killer POV in Michele's death scene. Fulci shows intense close-ups of Makara stabbing voodoo dolls before burying them and marking the graves with white powder to curse the children who disturbed the grave of her dead son. In the film's centerpiece scene, village men beat Makara with chains in a dilapidated graveyard as pop songs play an ironic counterpoint. After being left for dead, she crawls to the elevated highway and perishes on the side of the road as indifferent vacationers drive by. The final suspect, Patrizia, played by Bond girl Barbara Boucher, has troubling interactions with multiple children. She sexually torments Michele and is unable to account for her movements at the time of his murder. She offers Mario a kiss or 2,000 lire in exchange for help with a flat tire before he is killed. Milanese reporter Andrea Martelli finds Patrizia's gold lighter at the scene of Mario's death. She drags intellectual disabled Malvina to buy a new toy against the girl's wishes. Despite this damning behavior, Patricia is a recovering addict just looking for a fix in the final analysis. Local police captain Modesti and the regional police commissioner are the primary investigators on the case. Andrea is the citizen detective investigating parallel to the police. He is on site at every crime scene and publishes the clue that breaks the case, a picture of a decapitated Donald Duck doll. Andrea and Patricia discover that priest Donald Don Alberto is the killer. His sister Malvina had witnessed the murders and replicated Don Alberto's behavior on her dolls, popping Donald Duck's head off with the act of strangulation. In the stunning final scene, Don Alberto kidnaps Malvina only to be caught by Andrea and Patrizia as he's about to kill the girl by throwing her off a mountain. After a struggle with Andrea, Don Alberto falls to his death, his face mutilated by rocks. The subtext of Don Alberto's punishment, not just his death but the obliteration of his face into a bloody pulp, is that he is a pedophile. As he falls to his death, Fulci cuts to softlit scenes with the boys in church and playing soccer in pure white uniforms as Don Alberto explains in voiceover that he was protecting the children from the stirrings of the flesh. Incited to violence after discovering the boys had been spying on sex workers, Don Alberto's actions seem a displacement of guilt onto a moral high ground. The police 
police's statement that the children are unmolested is most likely a byproduct of censorship laws. Don Alberto symbolizes the hypocrisy of both the Catholic Church as an institution that perpetuates great harm, and the good Catholic town that put an innocent woman to death. In fact, Don't Torture a Duckling's central themes are hypocrisy and superstition in the rural South. Witches and supernatural forces coexist here with the Catholic Church. Fulci leans into social commentary and allegory, showing angry mobs, spitting villagers, and as we've seen with Makara's death, vigilantism. Local sorcerer Francesco services the town's black magic needs, even as the same townspeople go piously to mass each Sunday. Fulci foreshadows the killer's identity in the opening scenes by showing looming skeletons in the church as the boys pray. The Psychic, or a murder to the tune of the Seven Black Notes, is a supernatural giallo, the last mystery thriller Fulci would make before pivoting to gothic horror zombies in New York. It has a notable production history, languishing for several years in development hell, until Dino De Laurentiis introduced Fulci to screenwriter Giordano Sacchetti. Sacchetti had worked on Argento's The Cat of Nine Tales, Bava's A Bay of Blood, and many Polizio Tesci films, and would become a frequent collaborator of Fulci's until the two had a falling out in the 80s. He would write screenplays for Zombie, City of the Living Dead, The Beyond, The House by the Cemetery, The New York Ripper, Manhattan Baby, and much more, including works of other directors like Michele Suave, Lamberto Bava, and Umberto Lenzi. In The Psychic, Virginia remembers an incident from her childhood where her mother committed suicide by jumping off a cliff. She has a premonition at the exact moment of her mother's death, even though the two are a thousand miles apart. After seeing her husband been Francesco off, Virginia experiences cryptic images and goes into a fugue state, passing out at the wheel. After being reassured by parapsychologist Luca, Virginia takes on the project of renovating Francesco's familial estate. In Francesco's old bedroom, she has the same visions, which leads her to uncover a skeleton in the wall. Commissioner Delia and Inspector Russo arrest Francesco once they identify the corpse as his ex-girlfriend Agnese. Still troubled by the visions and wanting to clear her husband name. Virginia returns to the house to confer with Francesco's sister Gloria. Gloria gives Virginia the gift of a watch that plays a haunting tune. Virginia, Luca, and his secretary Bruna become amateur detectives chasing down leads from five years ago when Agnese went missing. This leads them to an art gallery housing several paintings from her vision. Virginia's clairvoyance provides some crucial misdirects which structure the mystery story. In fact, the visions are part flashback, part premonition. Virginia Virginia believes that the images are from the mystery of Agnese, which they are, but they also align with Francesco's attempt to kill Virginia in the final scene. Once Luca figures out that her visions are premonitions, Virginia is able to uncover crucial clues, like a letter hidden under an urn, which lead her to the film's dramatic finale where Francesco walls up Virginia as he did Agnese. The tune of Virginia's watch alerts the police that she has been walled up. Of course, Fulci doesn't make a traditional giallo here. Like Sergio Martino with All the Colors of the Dark and Dario Argento with Deep Red, Fulci adds an element of supernatural sleuthing in lieu of a conventional giallo killer. Virginia's visions are both portents of things to come and clues which lead them to Francesco's conspirator and murder accomplice, Raspini. Even Raspini, who we see with black gloves in one scene, is a misdirect, as it was Francesco who murdered the old woman, Signora Cassati, who was blackmailing them. The Psychic is a stylish murder mystery, but centers more on Virginia's experience of the uncanny. Sacchetti and Fulci structure the narrative around the device of predetermination, giving Virginia the role of an empty actor who marches towards her fate of entombment with every step. This is in stark contrast to the majority of Giallo, which are based in the real world, and trick audiences based on clues, twists, and perceptual devices. It is a direct line to the supernatural horror Fulci would rise to in the next two years, starting with Zombie. Fulci's infamous video Nasty, The New York Ripper, features a misogynistic killer with a traumatic backstory who talks in a duck squawk. 
Coming in well after the boom period, The New York Ripper is almost a Polizio Teshi. Like The Psychic, it is co-written by Dardano Sacchetti. If Fulci's 70s jolly display has resistant to adopting arch nemesis Argento's aesthetic, The New York Ripper pivots to an engagement with many mainstay giallo tropes. The killer design and use of subjective camera work is evident in this scene, where the killer murders a young woman on the Staten Island Ferry by gutting her with a razor. Under pressure from the police chief, played by Fulci himself, and desperate for answers, Lieutenant Williams consults with Columbia professor Dr. Davis, who begins to construct a psychological profile of the killer from the available forensic evidence. Williams also commiserates with state medical examiner Dr. Barry, exchanging quippy dialogue as Barry performs autopsies. The New York Ripper also reads very mid-century, despite taking place in the 80s. It shows a New York with graffiti-covered subways, a seedy Times Square, and menacing streets. Fulci transposes Italy's era of social and political unrest in the 70s to New York in the 80s, where every character is vulnerable to either fatal attacks or a crushing malaise, and he suffuses this atmosphere with his trademark cruel cynicism. In one scene, Dr. Davis tells Lieutenant Williams, you let me have all the data, and we wait for him to butcher another girl. The next killings exemplify the sleaze of the era. Millionaire Jane Lodge leads a kinky hidden life, attending a Times Square sex show with a tape recorder for her husband's later enjoyment. The show's main performer is then brutally murdered by the quacking killer. In another scene, Jane is nearly assaulted by two men in a seedy downtown cafe. She hooks up with Mickey, a gruff man into S&M who is missing two fingers, before she herself is killed. Mickey follows and attacks young student Faye Maid in the subway. He is a red herring, exonerated of the murders when the police find his body. He would have been dead at the time the killer murdered Williams's sex worker girlfriend Kitty. Kitty's death is the most gruesome of the film. The killer cuts her nipple in half and slits her eyeball with a razor. Faye has a hallucinatory nightmare where her boyfriend Peter Bunch repeatedly slashes her with a razor in an empty cinema. Like Carol Hammond in A Lizard in a Woman's Skin, Faye's nightmare cloaks the solution to the mystery in symbolic language. As citizen detective, Faye discovers Peter is indeed the killer when she overhears him talking to his daughter Susie in a duck voice. She finds a broken knife and hospital records for Susie, who suffers from a fatal lymphatic condition. Mickey had been procuring female victims for Peter, whose motive was to avenge Susie's fate by blotting out women privileged enough to grow into adulthood, yet who squandered away their lives in sex. As Fulci expert Stephen Thrower writes, Peter's killing of the stripper is symbolically intervaginal, manipulated by a twisted male whose sense of potency has been problematized by the failure of his genes to produce a daughter who can grow to womanhood. Rather than use the phallic or penetrative neck of the bottle, Peter instead attacks with a surrogate vagina dentata, as if to destroy womanhood with a perverse mutation of itself. Peter is like an inverted Don Alberto, who killed boys as punishment for the natural process of maturation and sexual awakening. His murders have the classic pathos of displaced trauma and imbue the film's visual style with a heightened atmosphere of virulently misogynistic violence. The New York Ripper was received harshly upon initial release, despite being one of Fulci's strongest films. Its extreme violence bridges his gory supernatural horror with his earlier Gialli. Inspired by Flashdance, Murder Rock, Dancing Death is Fulci's Disco Giallo, which follows a series of murders in a dance academy. Like Umberto Lenzi's Eyeball or Mario Bava's Five Dolls for an August Moon, it is somewhat of a bottle mystery, with all students and staff of the Arts for Living Center as suspects. Candace Norman and choreographer Margie rehearse a group of elite dance students. A gloved figure chloroforms then kills student Susan in the locker room by piercing her through the heart with a thin dance dagger that resembles a hat pin or ice pick. Susan's boyfriend Willie, who you might recognize as Gianni from Argento's Tenebrae, is the first obvious suspect as he was in the building at the time of her murder and disappears from next victim Janice's apartment moments before her death. Higher ups reveal in an early scene that they will only be selecting three dancers for an upcoming TV show, creating an atmosphere of extreme competitiveness and a possible motive for murder. Academy director Dick Gibson acts suspicious in every scene, evading Candace's questions pertaining 
pertaining to his sexual relationships with students. Police Lieutenant Borges clearly suspects Dick first, questioning him about the studio's social dynamics. He watches key interactions in the studio's control room, surveilling Candace and the students. In a later scene, police capture Dick running away from the scene of student Jill's murder. The choreographer Margie is another suspect, chloroforming and almost killing Candace in a truly laughable scene. She tries to replicate the killer's MO, but cannot go through with it. She tells Dick that her motive was disagreement over Candace's strict teaching methods. As more students end up dead, Candace has a nightmare where an unknown man, eventually revealed as washed-up actor George Webb, stabs her with a pin identical to the killer's. She tracks George down after seeing him on a billboard ad and tells the story of the traumatic hit-and-run motorcycle accident that ended her burgeoning Broadway career. As they have a romantic affair, Candace begins to suspect George of the murders. She alerts the police after finding an ornamental pin and bottle of chloroform in his desk. George is the number one suspect. Like Carol Hammond and Faye Majors' dreams, Candace's nightmare of George chasing and killing her foreshadows the solution to the mystery. Candace first meets him while he's in a drunken rage. She catches him flirting with a student with whom he had a prior relationship. Fulci makes a cameo as a talent agent who informs Candace of an incident from George's past where he had sex with an underage girl who died under mysterious circumstances. A fortune teller draws mystical chopsticks and proclaims George to be a murderer. But Candace is the true killer, framing obvious suspect George as retribution for hitting her with his motorcycle and ending her career. Like Don Alberto or Peter Bunch, Candace's murders are displacements of rage at a perceived injustice, punishing both George and the students who thrive in advance while she cannot. In their final confrontation, Candace opts for suicide by falling on the hairpin she planted in George's apartment, believing her life has no further purpose. Murder Rock has Polizio Tecci elements with a hard-boiled detective as one of its leads. Lieutenant Borges and his constant companion, profiler and psychotherapist Professor Davis, investigate crime scenes, interview the students en masse, ponder over the meaning of a dead bird, and confer with a voice analyst with a cool oscilloscope computer. Borges is bitterly cynical and corrupt. In one scene, he assaults a suspect, one of the male dancers Bart, and flippantly dismisses his Miranda rights. Murder Rock is more of an 80s low-budget horror cash grab than a giallo. While there are some fantastic dance scenes we think inspired Gaspar Noe's climax, the central murder mystery is implausible to the point of cheating cheesiness. Notoriously sharp-tongued, Fulci wasn't afraid to hide his dislike of main rival Jario Argento. Argento tended to dwell on a limited set of thematic preoccupations centered on his own neuroses, whereas Fulci tempered his artistic flourishes with stark realism, leading to an essentially sardonic worldview. Unlike Argento, Fulci disliked repeating himself too often and endeavored to work in many genres. They did forge a friendship in the 90s, and the two were slated to remake Andre de Toth's House of Wax. However, this project never materialized in Fulci's lifetime. In 1997, Argento protege and special effects master Sergio Stivaletti directed a version called The Wax Mask. Fulci's health had started to decline around the time of Murder Rock Dancing Death when he contracted liver disease which eventually developed into cirrhosis. He passed away from diabetes complications after a series of Z-grade horror films, the most notorious of which is Zombie 3. Argento paid for then destitute Fulci's funeral. Fulci's legacy is primarily in supernatural horror. The only real homage to his gialli is Malignant, directed by James Wan. But other directors take inspiration from Fulci's Zombie and his Death Door trilogy of City of the Living Dead, The Beyond, and The House by the Cemetery. Zombie is probably his most well-known film, with its underwater shark fight, eyeball gouge, and maggot-infested zombie. The City of the Living Dead features a young woman retching up her own intestines. The Beyond Beyond has a scene of tarantulas devouring a man's face. Beyond gore, Fulci's background in art lends his supernatural films an aesthetic of surrealist anarchy. We can see this lineage in Rob Zombie's Lords of Salem and Tony Randall's Hellraiser 2. Quentin Tarantino also cited Fulci's The Beyond as a major influence on his own work, and in 1998 re-released the uncensored version with original score. Two months before his death in 1996, Fulci's final public appearance was at the Fangoria Horror Convention in New York, where he appeared on crutches with a bandaged foot, shocked that he had so many fans outside of Italy.
And that's our discussion of Lucio Falci. Join us next time for our Giallo wrap-up with a brief discussion of other Giallo directors. Until then, you can check out our past videos or find genre fans wherever you listen to podcasts. Remember to like, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and select all so you can know first thing when we post. Don't forget to let your film nerd friends know about our channel. Thanks. See you soon. Thank you.